Hello. I wanted to let you know about a special opportunity to join me and an amazing group of women for brunch on September 22nd at 1230 in Wayne, Pennsylvania. You'll enjoy fabulous food and great company. I'll be there to talk about my book, The Vital Spark, reclaim your outlaw energies and find your feminine fire, and every guest will get a signed copy. In the process of growing up and adapting to external demands, women often cut themselves off from vivifying qualities such as shrewdness, cunning, and disagreeableness. We think we're not allowed to be such things, but reclaiming and integrating these qualities brings new energy for living. I hope you'll join me on the 22nd if you're in the Philly area. For more information or to register, contact Jill at happywomendinners.com. That's Jill at happywomendinners.com. Thanks. Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Today, um, at listener request, many listeners, we are going to engage in the question of how parental complexes affect children. And interestingly, each of us went in a somewhat different direction. Lisa, unsurprisingly, has a really good fairy tale for us. And uh, Joseph and I have looked more at uh, childhood and various implications of and impacts of parental and other impressions on children. So with all that, um, here we go. So I just want to actually start by saying that this was a topic that was voted on by supporters in our Patreon community. And just to remind you that if you would like to vote on future topics, you can consider becoming a patron. You can go to our website, thisunionlife.com go to our podcast, and there's a link there on that page to our Patreon. Yeah, and it's wonderful to have the the votes and the suggestions. They help us and give you something that you're interested in listening to. Who wants to jump into the pool first? <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, all right. I will. I'll jump in um, a little bit. That you know what what I started with was you know the very earliest beginnings of a child as as an infant, and uh, in in myth how uh, the child is strong enough, the baby is strong enough to survive, but is also very weak and very vulnerable. Um, we want children to grow up. Uh, they are the future. We want them to realize their potential. And the theme of abandonment, um, which today we might really frame as emotional abandonment, is all over the place with fairy tales and in mythology. So this topic of parental complexes on children is as old as we are. As, as homo sapiens. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I guess, I guess maybe my sort of, uh, so, so, so we could maybe, maybe the first place to start is to talk about what a complex is. Okay. <laughs> so Jung said that complexes were feeling tone webs of associations and memories around an archetypal core, which probably doesn't mean that much. So let me try again. You know, we we each come into the world with innate expectations for certain experiences. Those innate expectations get shaped in our psyche by uh, by experiences in childhood, often with our caregivers, with our teachers, 
So for example, you might have a complex around authority. You know, maybe your, your father was a real authoritarian who made you feel very small whenever you did anything wrong or, or didn't do something you were supposed to do. And then we could say that that might result in a kind of authority complex. So there are places in the psyche often that are a, a little bit of a disturbance. I think about it as a disturbance of consciousness. You know, Jung discovered the ideas of com- the idea of complexes uh, through the word association test. So you know, he might say table, and, and a person without a table complex would say chair. But someone with a complex in that area, maybe that person came from a family who didn't usually eat meals together and there was a lot of chaos around mealtime, that person might come up with something really odd at table. They might come up with, you know, something like sad or something. And it would be a, an unusual response. Maybe it took the person a few extra seconds to come up with the response or the person laughed inappropriately or made a funny face. And then Jung would say, okay, there is a disturbance in consciousness that we can actually measure and we can wonder what that is. So, so that's, that's the idea behind complexes is that they're, they're sort of disturbances. So if you think about where are my complexes, where are the, the places in your life where you have a kind of habitual difficulty, where you always, you know that every time you know, this certain, this certain kind of person always is hard for you, or that when someone changes plans at the last minute that you tend to really get thrown for a loop, or you always have a hard time at holidays. I mean, you can sort of think about that. Okay, where are my complexes? So, but complexes are normal. Hopefully we can become conscious of them. And then we, we can have, you know, Jung said, you can have a complex instead of the complex having you. But we all have complexes and we never fully resolve them. So, so I think, you know, Deb, one of the differences in the ways that you and I came at this is I'm kind of thinking of like, hey, parents have complexes. <laughs> it's normal. It's kind of like a normal level of, of psychic disturbance. And, and so how do those complexes affect our, our child? And does it make a difference if we're aware of them? Does it, you know, does it help if we are that child who was affected by a parental complex to become conscious of that? But obviously, there can be greater disturbances. There can be kind of profound lapses in attunement that are the result of very serious complexes that really affect functioning. And those can really be uh, kind of result in, in the kind of abandonment that you're talking about. Mm-hmm. And I think in a way that that might be the core of this whole dynamic is that there are places where, as children, of course, we're affected by our parents in all kinds of ways, and no one's parents are perfect. But that's the complex, and it sets off a complex in a child. Right. So, so I'm wondering if we have some examples. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking in my sort of ordinary version. I'm thinking of an example maybe where um, maybe, maybe someone uh, really has kind of an outsider complex. Uh, maybe someone, let, let's say, grew up poor, because that, that's, there's a whole psychology around that. And uh, let's say grew up poor, but sort of made good and, and was kind of living and moving in very different circles, but still has that kind of raised poor complex. You feel like an outsider, you feel like you don't quite know how to keep up with the conversation, or you feel maybe on tenter hooks, like waiting for a slight or, you know, someone to express that you really aren't good enough to be there. So if you're a child of that person with that complex, say, what might that look like? And, and my hypothesis, or I've seen things like this, I guess, is, is that the child who herself perhaps wasn't growing up poor, wasn't in any way different from the peers in the neighborhood, but because of that unconscious patterning, because of, let's say, the mother's uh, complex, might might find for a reason that seems kind of mysterious, that she too feels like an outsider, that she feels like she doesn't belong, 
So she's kind of carrying the mother's complex. And, and that could, you know, affect many aspects of her life going forward. It's not, it, it's not traumatogenic, you know, it's, it's just how are we influenced by our parents? I want to say there, there are struggles, there are psychological struggles, both conscious and unconscious. Mm-hmm. I, I also want to uh, widen the frame for parental complex to all the kinds of parenting that children have uh, by religious institutions, mm-hmm. schools, uh, yep. a particular culture, holidays. All of these are parental in the sense that they are bigger than the child and they exert an influence that the child is incapable of reflecting on as a three-year-old or an eight-year-old or even a 15-year-old. So there are lots of ways that we absorb uh, parental complexes beyond the personal parents. And what's, I think, most important is that the parental complex is unconscious. That if the parents were fully conscious of these attitudes, Mm-hmm. behaviors, memories, that that would depotentiate some of the energy. And this goes into the kind of uncanny dynamic that Jung was interested in, is that these things may never be spoken explicitly in the home. For instance, a fear of loss or deprivation or a fear of authority. But it's demonstrated in all the, the thousands of tiny ways that a parent behaves and the child absorbs indirectly. There's also a communication between the unconscious of the child and the unconscious of the, of the parent. There is a kind of merging that naturally happens between parents and children. So it's a lack of awareness, particularly, that makes the parent's unconscious so hot and dynamic and creates such a significant impression on the child. And if it's unconscious, then we know for the parent, there is something disturbing in the parent's ego structure, such that it's defending against knowing it. So the parent doesn't want to know the material, but is powerfully influenced by it. And the child's psyche, as we all were, is staring at the parent, drinking in every tiny little impression. And so the parent's complex, or the unconscious subroutine that the computer in the parent's personality is running, absolutely influences the child, and not necessarily by infecting it exactly. Sometimes it affects the child, and what we see symptomatically is the child's resistance to the complex causes them to act in ways that don't make sense outwardly, that they are in an inner war. Absolutely. There's a a quote by Jung that I think um, builds on what you just said, Joseph, Which, and here it is. All the life which the parents could have lived, but of which they thwarted themselves for artificial motives, is passed on to the children in substitute form. The children are driven unconsciously in a direction that is intended to compensate for everything that was left unfulfilled in the lives of the parents. Hence, it is that excessively moral-minded parents have what are called unmoral children, or an irresponsible wastrel of a father has a son with a positively morbid amount of ambition, and so on. And so Jung is talking about how unconsciously the child picks up a parental complex and tends to go in the opposite direction as a means of balancing the family psyche or the parent-child psyche. Well, there's that. I also tend to imagine people's psyches as landscapes because I have a very (laughs) visual imagination. So if we think of, let's say dad has a, a money complex and there's a great atmosphere of fear and deprivation. And so there's a kind of hoarding energy. 
he doesn't even know it. It just, to him, seems like that's how you do it. I mean, that's just the normal formula for getting through the world. So it's as if that agenda, that kind of starving inner figure who's grasping for whatever stuff that he can find, goes into the child's landscape. Now, that figure is standing there in the child's soul. The child could take that as an advisor and say, oh, okay, that seems like good advice to me. But sometimes there is an archetypal response in the child's psyche that says no and, f- and stands up and fights against this grasping figure. And because it's an archetypal reaction, often the child will go far to the opposite mm-hmm. side yeah, exactly. and might be a spendthrift or fantasize that this kind of possession of Jupiter, which is the god of bounty in all ways, so the child begins behaving, and this can be evidenced in first, second grade, behaves in a way as if they have endless resources. So you have stories of mom or dad save up and they give the child a gift, and then they find out that the child gave it to someone else in the neighborhood, just gave it away. And the parents are distraught about that. It's like, oh my gosh, what did you do? And the child, in it, sense of kind of benevolent, fulsome generosity. It's like, of course. And and it's not so much that they're being a Christ-like in the generosity. It's this Jupiter inside of them tells them uh, that this generous bounty is in all places at all times, which of course it isn't. So neither the deprivation of the parents is accurate and neither is the endless generosity that the archetype tells the child is in there. And again, both of it is totally unconscious. Right. So, so I have this example from Jung's life, which I, <laughs> which I think is kind of ridiculous. But I do think there's something here that's interesting. So um, this isn't Barbara Hanna's biography, and she's talking about his long-term affair with Tony Wolf. And, um, you know, she's basically trying to justify the fact that he was, ha- had this affair with Tony Wolf. And he says he, she says, he once told Marie-Louise von Franz and me that, curiously enough, it was his family that had given him the final impetus to seek a modus vivendi, whatever it might cost. In other words, that it was his family that, that uh, impelled him to live out his feelings for, for Tony Wolf and, and um, consummate that relationship. He knew from his practice how necessary this was, for he had already seen all too often the untold damage that fathers can do to their daughters by not living the whole of their erotic life, which is seldom completely contained in the marriage and the father's unlived life is then unconsciously displaced onto the daughters. He told us that this fear had kept him awake a whole night, a night during which he slowly realized that if he refused to live the outside attraction that had come to him entirely from the unconscious against his will, he would inevitably ruin his daughter's eros. Hmm. (laughs) Does that sound like a rationalization to anybody except me? It it does. I mean, I remember the first time I read that, I was like, really? Um, and yet I I, you know, I I think I think there's something there. There's a nugget of something there, you know, that that to to feel to feel so pulled in any direction and not somehow take responsibility for it, whether or not you actually have to live it out is maybe the question. But that that can sometimes really um uh affect kind of, you know, affect affect the kids in in the way that you were talking about, Joseph. So looking back at that moment, I think what's important is that in the beginning of that affair with Tony Wolf, Jung had not discovered alchemy yet. Mm -hmm. And it was his discoveries in alchemy that taught him how to contain instinctive affect and facilitate its transformation into other things. Mm. And so prior to that, still being influenced by Freud in many ways, there's a sense that repression makes you sick, 
It makes the family sick. Oh, it makes you really neurotic and makes you, uh, makes you a mess. So part of the justification is, yes, I don't want to make my kids messed up. There is some, at that point, theoretically, a sense that if I just damn all of this up, I'm going to get sick in myself. And the other thing we have to also understand is that Tony Wolf uh, was very interested in this, that Tony Wolf was also beckoning to this process. So people turn a jaundiced eye to Jung in those moments because we don't have enough of Tony Wolf's voice. And she was, frankly, more discreet than Jung was because Jung's clearly talking about all of this with his colleagues and we don't have an account of Tony Wolf. So we have two adults making a decision based upon a certain theoretical standard and also caught in a passionate web of energy in that regard. But it was later in life, and this is where we get this very importantly, yeah. is how containing things without repressing them yes. sets in motion a creative change. Yeah. And that was later. And, yeah, Tony, no, that's and really interestingly, great. Tony left him yes. because he wanted to study that. Yes, yes. No, that's, that's, I appreciate that, Joseph. And I, I, I wasn't trying to, to necessarily, you know, kind of bash Jung there. I mean, I will say that, yeah, Tony and, and Jung were consenting adults, whatever, but there was Emma in the picture too. So I, I don't want to, you know, th there, there, were, there were harms. But, but, I, but I think you, you raised such a good point that he was operating under the framework of repression and and so that this would become a, a kind of you know that, that that there there is a complex at work here, and and if he didn't deal with it correctly, his concern was that he would sort of pass that along in some unconscious process to his daughters, and and I and I do think that when we uh, you know I, I mean so for example. My mother, I think, and I don't, I don't really know this for sure, but I, you know, she was a very intelligent, creative person, and, and she had ambitions at times. She had real ambitions, but she never, um, I, I think it's fair to say, she never really fully gave herself permission, or even maybe was not given permission to fully invest in, in them. And, and so, you know, what, what, how did that affect me when it came to my own creative impulses or my own uh, kind of ambitions? And, and I think there is a kind of complex thing there that I had to work through because there, there was this sort of undertow of the way that she maybe felt constrained and had to hold herself back. And that was bequeathed to me through an unconscious process. And, and I, and I had to, kind of work that out, you know? I mean, I think these complexes do travel through generational lines. And one of the sort of exciting ideas is that when you are able to kind of effectively overcome the complex or let, let's, I don't, I don't want to say overcome, say find a definitive response to it. There's a way where you sort of heal the previous generations back through time. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to loop back because our topic is the effect on children to, you know, Jung defending uh, his uh, freedom of uh, erotic expression, let us say. And he, Tony Wolf was his collaborator and partner and, and intellectual also a companion. Of well, but the children were very defensive of their mother. And of so course. there's. It wasn't just, um, you know, sort of uh, freeing his daughters uh, to full expression of their feminine selves. Uh, they, were, they were expected to conform to cultural norms, which are fairly uh, strict at that time, uh, specific, I should say, in Switzerland. And they, they were aware of the negative impact of this relationship on their mother, Emma and uh, whatever they carried from that uh, for themselves. Uh, so it's, it's complicated. It doesn't just parse down into right and wrong, but it, it, what we are lifting up here is how incredibly important it is to be conscious, to, to know uh, this is what I'm doing, or I, 
I have a complex about that. I have a real complex about uh, getting out there and speaking my mind, or I have a complex about money, or I have a complex about a, a hundred things. Uh, at at yeah. least then it's out there and yeah. and can be spoken, and then is not so insidious uh, and deleterious. So I think it's also really helpful if you're doing your own psychological work to be aware of what your parents' complexes were and the surprising ways yeah. that you might have taken yeah. that on board. So, for example, I'm I'm thinking of um, of a, a man whose mother had been like just terribly um, who, who'd been who'd been very uh, um, who who'd slept around a lot, who cheated on his dad a lot. She'd had all kinds of affairs, and it created a lot of chaos in the family. Um, the the husband never left her, but he was always kind of heartbroken and bereft. And you know, this this man felt like his mother was often kind of not really available because she was pursuing these other uh, liaisons. And so, you know, that that's really where her energetic focus was. So it was it was a real wound, and it was something you know that we we discussed a lot. And then, um, you know, he was he was a very kind of um, loving, sentimental person, very loyal, uh, fell in love, got married. Uh, we didn't, we didn't see each other for a while. And then at some point he came back into treatment and he was cheating. He was cheating on his, his wife and, and felt really, uh, you know, it, it was difficult for him to make the connection with, with the wound that he had carried into adulthood about his mother's infidelity. And and how that had affected the family, you know, it's like it, it was a it was a whole thing, and and he thought he had sort of renounced it, like oh I would never do that. He'd really identified with his father, but then there he was, and he was in some sense living out this inherited complex. And I think one of the things that's very hard to describe as analysts, but also for those who are coming to talk with us, is how that experience with his mother changed the structure of his psyche. Mm -hmm. Because the outer behavior, let's say, of his mom having multiple affairs, the father knowing this, it's difficult to know how she was structured such that that was either normalized or perhaps it was highly compulsive Mm -hmm. Was this um, related to bipolar mania? Mm -hmm. Because sometimes that can happen, or alcoholism. Yeah. So many different factors that play in, all of which then color the way in which it, it could, but not always, but could slide into the chi child's psyche. No, uh, not the least of which is the kind of attachment disorder which is being demonstrated. Mm -hmm. in the uh, situation and lack of empathy and all kinds of other things. Mm. So I'm curious with that person, Lisa, did you, have, uh, did you have a sense of how the mother was structured such that that made sense to her? And, and what part of that structure was kind of tucked into that person? Uh, and I know I'm just asking this off the cuff, but I'm wondering if you have a sense of it. I mean, I, and of course, I'm sort of making it up because this is really a composite case anyway. I, yeah, I wouldn't yeah. share someone's material like this, so it's I'm it's somewhat fictionalized. But what I would say is, um, there was real narcissism. Okay. There was real. There was real. Uh, pretty. Uh, there was a lot of narcissism in in the mother. So, um, you know, and, 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 and this man that I worked with did not have that at all, except I think he did in this one little corner tucked away, but it wasn't his, I mean, it was a very likable person. It wasn't his predominant way of moving through the world. You know, um, I'm thinking about how in, you know, today's world, much of the wounding and the kind of abandonment is emotional you know, rather than the physical abandonment of children, which was pretty much universal and uh, frequent of huge numbers of physically abandoned children. And that abandonment, when the wound is unspoken and unacknowledged, creates a hurt 
that then results in the self-abandonment or self-estrangement, which is what you were talking about, Lisa, with this uh, somewhat fictionalized man, that because his mother's wound had never really been processed, spoken, acknowledged, explored, he acted it out unconsciously Mm -hmm. when he became an adult and had affairs. And and that that is where the real wounding from a parent to a child takes place is it's it's not known it's not spoken it's not verbalized it's not even cognitively recognized it's just there. Mm-hmm. Our Patreon has had a makeover. There's lots of new content and ways to engage with us. Patrons who support us at the five dollar level and up will now access Young Love. Weekly bonus episodes where the three of us discuss dreams and questions sent in by supporters. At the $10 level, you can vote on topics for podcast episodes and vote on which guests we invite. And at the $25 level, you'll also be able to watch behind-the-scenes content and even join us for occasional live events. If you'd like to be a part of all this, the link to our Patreon is in the show notes. Thank you so much for your support. We couldn't do it without you. So one of the ways that I, again, like to put this on a landscape, I'm just, I know this is a somewhat fictional story, but we have a mother who's kind of an Aphrodite figure, who's mm. not going to be contained in one relationship. She's going to follow a kind of erotic impulse. Mm-hmm. And then she has a child whose image of the mother is a kind of Aphrodite energy. Father, perhaps the wounded, angry, earthy hephaestus. And so inside of the psyche, there's a mother-child dyad that constellates. Inside his landscape, there's an image of the inner child who is coupled with Aphrodite. So now we have Cupid and Venus, or Aphrodite, moving along. When he continues to identify as the child of Aphrodite, he's a kind of a cherub sweet, tossing little arrows of love into the analyst and into other people, and he's adorable. But one of the strange things that happens to all of us in those situations is sometimes he's Cupid, but sometimes he's also Aphrodite, and he doesn't know it. So the ego can switch its identification, and when the spirit of Aphrodite, the spirit of the mother, takes him over, then all of a sudden, attitudes change, feelings change, and a number of things seems possible that would not otherwise be. So in another kind of archetypal way of thinking of how things get activated in the child, I'm thinking of a, a, another s- story which I think is really important, is that uh, thinking of a client um, whose mother was uh, kind of very beautiful and really remarkably narcissistic in a way that was very hostile. And so she had a fantasy that her very successful husband was limiting her potential and that the entire um, world of men was always keeping her under its thumb and she couldn't possibly actualize, and she has a son. And that son is my analysand. And so she's constantly monitoring the son for any signs of masculinity, because that's the dastardly thing that was keeping her under its thumb. She also treated him like an art project. So anytime she was with him, the child would express an interest in something, and the mother would say, oh, you're not interested in that. Let's go over here and do this. And the thing that she would suggest wasn't bad. It might be a different kind of project. But the Analysand grew up constantly not sure where to look for what he actually wanted. And does what he want? Is that wrong? Is that crazy? So this tremendous alienation from himself and that the narcissistic mother becomes the self. The mother eventually decides that she's oppressed, leaves. And then 
finds another woman to take care of her in a platonic relationship and never works, never produces anything of significance, but lives somewhat parasitically and yet free of what she fantasizes is limiting her. So the fantasy that she is oppressed externally was actually an illusion, and that what was actually happening is her own father complex, which was very, very harsh and very, very negative, was actually oppressing her internally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that what she was seeing, or she thought she saw both in her son and in the men around her, was a ghost. She undoubtedly thought she was protecting her son from being infested by these terrible qualities that her father had, but in the same way, left him castrated and frightened and confused and, and unsure. So he didn't become the mother. He didn't rise up in some uh, grand, queenly way, but left him small and anxious and unsure and captured in this quality of looking for people to shine upon him the way the mother would when he pleased her. So again, another kind of Cupid story where the small one thinks his job is to constantly satellite around the mother. And part of the transformation was for him to finally connect to that rage inside of him, to push that image of the mother out of him, to dethrone her as the self so that he could create a kind of privacy in himself and then ask the real simple question of, what do I like? And just that simple question, what do I like? So these structural things get passed back and forth. Again, it's totally unconscious. There's no nefarious plan that's being plotted. Nobody wakes up one morning and says, ooh, I'll be a narcissist. How wonderful. Like, these, these structures are inflicted on people, often because of trauma. And yet, those structures create very unpredictable effects in children. And discovering or analyzing the parents is not to blame the parent, because as I said, nobody wakes up one morning and says, I'm going to become so symptomatic that I'm going to make my kid's life miserable. Mm -hmm. like, that is not how it happens. But by analyzing the parent, in retrospect, of course, one is also analyzing the effect inside of the psyche, and that affords sometimes the opportunity for the ego to say, I'm over here, the parental complex is over there, and can something freeing, unique, open up inside of me with that space? So one of the things I think um, you're talking about, Joseph, is you know, one of the things that Eric Erickson mentioned, and he has famously articulated something like eight stages of uh, development along the life trajectory from infancy to old age. But this one seems to be, you know, the story of initiative uh, versus guilt of, can I do what I like? Do I know what I like? Um, my parents like to do this, but I like to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, and is that okay uh, versus feeling uh, constrained and guilty if you differ from your parents, if you have other urges, longings, desires, and interests? Uh, and that, in turn, leads to the ability to sort of be self-observing. Mm -hmm. You know, if you can take initiative, then you see that when I try to play the xylophone, what happens? Oh, this, this doesn't sound very good. Uh, I've just reflected on my mm -hmm. xylophone playing ability uh, v versus having to sort of don a false identity in order to please the parent. Yes. And I think the Ericksonian insights are assuming a normal family. 
So there's normal families and a normal mm-hmm. developmental yep. stages that a child goes through. What we're talking about, which does not apply to all of the listeners, of course it doesn't, is when the parents are carrying an unconscious burden that is unusual. Mm-hmm. And then it creates unusual effects yes. in the child. And the child has this labor right. that a fate has assigned to them later in life. I feel like all of us have, I mean, I do think it's like normal to be carrying some of your parents' complexes or, or that they, your parents' complexes affected you somehow. Like it, but, it, but there's like the normal level, which is some of the examples that I've given. And then there's like these kind of more substantial uh, disturbances. Um, you know, just as something about your story, I was thinking about, you know, because she was she was sort of trying to take she was taking her past and uh, kind of letting it affect how she parented. Right. And I was of thinking of that phrase, something like, you know, the generals are always fighting the last war. Mm. And, and I think I think yeah. that's kind of true for all of us psychologically. Right. We we had our own wounds, whatever they were in childhood. And then often as parents were like, well, I'm not going to do that. And, and so, but then you realize that, you know, maybe you kind of, you do something else um, or, 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 you, you know, in an interesting way, the, ch- the psyche of the child is influenced by these patterns that are really old. So I'm thinking of, you know, so, so I'm, I'm sort of, you know, Gen X, you know, uh, and, and I, I, you know, in my generation, most of us had parents or like grandparents, maybe more so, who really were um, alive during the Depression. And so no matter what the professional trajectory of our parents, our, our, you know, our grandparents often had that Depression mentality where you like, I don't know, you like wash out your plastic bags or whatever, you know, there's this kind of scarcity mentality that then our parents had to deal with and, you know, I know what that looked like in my family. <laughs> it looked like um, just confusion because they came from nothing financially, my parents did, but then, you know, kind of entered into this different sphere as my dad achieved some financial and professional success. And so the messages around money, for example, were just very confusing in my household. They were very mixed. And then I brought that into my life with my kids. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do this. But I've certainly, you know, so this is like tumbled down through the generations in some way. So one of the things that this brings up for me is uh, that when you mention confusion, (laughs) is that, well, that that's what happens to a kid. Uh, I'm confused. I don't get it. You know, why can't we? go here or why can't we go uh, why can't we ever go out to eat or why why can't i just have all the other kids have new shoes and i don't and i want this special kind of sneaker but you know whatever my mother says no this is good enough it is the arbitrariness versus the sense that a child has is that what the parent does has reason and meaning and predictability to it Versus just this arbitrary thing of no, you can't. Right, and if it's if the parent is acting from a complex place, and by the way, we all have huge money complexes. Like I don't know anyone that doesn't. Then, then, like you're saying, Deb, it like doesn't it doesn't it it doesn't make sense because it maybe doesn't match with reality because that's the thing about complexes is that they distort your experience of reality. It it, it distorts how you see things. It it also distorts uh, one's um, one's own sense of being able to trust oneself that that I talked about a little bit before that I don't see why I can't have these sneakers like everybody else has. We don't look like we're really really poor or really having to watch every penny. Our house is a lot like the other kids where I go over and play. And so who do I trust? Can I trust my own perception? You know, if I'm seven or nine or 12, or do I have to trust my parents and something about that doesn't fit? So that's where the the sort of the self-doubt uh, versus self-confidence 
starts to work its way in. And I, I do agree, you know, to some extent, we all have to survive our childhoods. Childhood has never been easy. Everybody's parents have complexes. There, there are all kinds of arbitrary um, black swan events that happen. And our job is to do that work ourselves, in ourselves, of what were the parental complexes we inherited and what are the parental complexes we have and are hopefully not passing on to our children. Yes, that's really the whole point of the conversation is not for people to, you know, rise up and storm their parents' homes with, you know, <laughs> accusations, but really to be able to map our own psyches and ask ourselves, um, what's going on in there? You know, th there's a certain forensic attitude that we take in the analytic world, you know, trying to, trying to investigate ourselves because long after our parents pass away, both of my parents are deceased. I'm just left with my own psyche and what am I going to do right. with my self? And, and, and that's the work. So at some point, yes, we can tell our narrative of, of my mother did this and my father did that and et cetera, et cetera. We need to get the um, suffering a little bit cooled down by just telling the narratives, of course. And where people often fail to do the next stage, which is then to look into the mirror and say, how have I been distorted, warped, malformed by that experience, and I've got to put my hands in that clay and begin slowly, slowly to shape this in a way that I feel better and more functional and safer, happier, creative, all the good stuff that you really want. But it's only your hands that are going to reach in there and start moving that around. And we have that chance to recapitulate some of the childhood stages that Erickson defines that we have, may have missed of how do we become more autonomous, more self-trusting, more self-reflective? How do we know, begin to know how to take initiative, what I want, what I like? Uh, and, and that's the job of working with ourselves and whatever was unfinished or damaged in childhood. But that's right. It's our hands, metaphorically speaking, that have to do the work with ourselves. I wanted to say one thing, Deb, you said, hopefully we don't pass these on to our kids, but we can't not. And in some sense, the stuff that we get passed on from our, from our parents, it kind of is the prima materia, the yeah. clay that you're both talking about. And so in a, in a way, it's sort of, I, I, I'm really wanting to just sort of make it value neutral. Like we're gonna pass stuff on to our kids. Some of it will be good, by the way. And, and we're, and we're going to, you know, yeah. have shit from our parents. And, and that's where, that's kind of where the, the alchemy is. But I want to um, maybe just talk about this fairy tale. I'm so excited because I've yeah. long thought about this fairy tale, that it's kind of an example of this. And so I want to, uh, uh, I'm going to read it. Um, Deb and Joseph have suggested that it's important to read it. It's a fairy tale from the American South called Wiley and the Hairy Man. And I'll, I'll set it up so that you can sort of follow along. I think this is about a boy, who a hero, whose father had a, a trauma or a failure or a pretty big complex that enveloped him and kind of ate him alive. And now the young man on stepping out into the world finds himself meeting the same complex. But this time with his mother's help, he's able to uh, kind of find a different ending. So, um, a boy named Wiley lived in a cabin with his mama down by the edge of the swamp. One cold night, Wiley's daddy fell off the ferry boat, and no one could find hide nor hair of him afterward. Folks whispered that the hairy man must have carried him off. Then they heard someone laughing way back in the trees. That's the hairy man for sure, folks agreed and they stopped looking for Wiley's daddy. You be careful, Wiley, said Wiley's mama. The hairy man got your daddy, and he'll get you too if you don't watch out. 
Don't worry, Mama, Wiley said. I'll take my hound dogs everywhere I go. That hairy man can't stand hound dogs. Wiley's mama smiled because she knew that was true. Wiley's mama knew lots of things like conjure magic. One day, Wiley went out to gather kindling wood and he left his hound dogs tied up on the porch. He couldn't find much wood, so he kept walking deeper and deeper into the swamp. Everything was still and quiet and Wiley felt a chill climb up the back of his neck. He turned around real quick and saw a man coming toward him through the trees, grinning. The man sure was ugly, and that grin didn't help much. He was hairy all over, and his eyes glowed red. Hello, Wiley, the man said. Don't you look at me that way, Mr. Hairy Man, said Wiley. He glanced down and saw that the hairy man didn't have feet like a person. He had feet like a cow. Now, Wiley reckoned he had never seen a cow up a tree, so straight away he shimmied up the nearest bay tree. You come down here, Wiley, shouted the hairy man. You come up and get me, Wiley shouted back. The hairy man just grinned and drool rolled off his long yellow teeth. No, thank you, Wiley. I'll just wait right here till you get tired or hungry. Wiley thought about that hairy man down there on the ground, and he thought about his hound dogs back at home, and he came up with a plan. Mr. Hairy Man, I hear you know conjure magic. Why, I'm the best conjure man in the county, the hairy man boasted. I'll bet you can't make something just disappear, said Wiley. Something like that bird's nest sitting on the end of the branch, the hairy man asked. Now it's disappeared. Wiley looked at the empty branch. Well, how do I know that bird's nest was there in the first place? I'll bet you can't make something disappear that I know is there. Ha, <laughs> ha, chuckled the hairy man. Where's your shirt? Wiley looked down and his shirt was gone. Ah, that's just a plain, ordinary, everyday shirt, Wiley said. But I'll bet you can't make this disappear. And he pointed to the rope that was holding up his britches. This rope is special because my mama used conjure on it. No one can make my mama's conjure rope disappear. Shucks. I can make every single piece of rope in this whole county disappear. Then the hairy man roared out, Every rope in this here county has done disappeared. Wiley held tight to his britches to keep them from falling down, and he laughed, because the hairy man had done just what he wanted him to do. Yes, sir, you're a mighty good conjure man, said Wiley. He took a big, deep breath and called out, Here, dogs! Here, dogs! Here, dogs! (laughs) There was a sound of hound dogs yelping and barking, coming closer and closer. That old hairy man took off into the swamp, lickety-split. Wiley ran on home and told his mama what had happened. Wiley, she said, you fooled the hairy man one time, and that's good. If you can fool him twice more, he'll be bound to stay away from you for good and forever. I hope I never see him again with that ugly hair and slobbering grin. Tell me, Wiley, was he carrying a sack? Wiley's mom asked. Yes, ma'am, a big croaker sack. Wiley's mama smiled. I just thought of a way for you to put the hairy man in the dirt. If I put him in the dirt, he'll put me in his croaker sack. Listen to me, said his mama. Go into the swamp tomorrow and leave your dogs here at home. When you see the hairy man... Tell him he can't change himself into some great big animal. If, he's, if you say he can't do something, he'll do it for sure. Then tell him he can't turn himself into some small, slow animal, and he'll do that too. And when he does, shove that hairy man slam bang into the croaker sack. Then I can toss him into the river with the croaker fish, laughed Wiley. The next morning, Wiley shut his dogs in the cabin and walked off toward the swamp, whistling all the while to keep up his courage. He hadn't gone far when he got that same creepy feeling on the back of his neck. The next instant, the hairy man stepped from behind a tree and stood right in front of him. Hello there, Wiley. Hello, hairy man, said Wiley. What have you got in that croaker sack? I ain't got nothing yet, Wiley. The hairy man grunted and he laid the sack down on the ground next to him. Mr. Hairy Man, said Wiley, I hear tell you can change yourself into any animal you want. You heard right said the hairy man, and he was grinning real big and drooling something fierce. You can't change into a great big animal like a bear, said Wiley. 
the hairy man spun around and there stood a huge hairy bear. And that bear was just smiling and drooling and looking straight at Wiley. That's pr pretty good, said Wiley, but you can't change into an alligator. The bear whirled around and two seconds later, Wiley was staring straight down into an alligator's mouth full of slobbery yellow teeth. You sure are a good conjure man, said Wiley, but you can't change yourself into a little bitty baby possum. The alligator twisted and turned, and when the dust settled, there was a tiny possum crawling in the dirt. Wiley grabbed the possum and slammed it into the croaker sack. He tied it up real tight and went and threw it into the river. Wiley started off home feeling mighty proud of himself, but then he heard the hairy man's voice rising up out of the swamp. Wiley! Wiley, I'm coming to get you tonight. Wiley ran as fast as his legs could carry him. I did exactly what you said, he told his mama, but the hairy man got out of the sack and he says he's coming here to get me tonight. Why, that hairy man must have conjured up the wind to blow him out of that sack, said Wiley's mama. But still, you did fool him a second time. And she sat in a rocking chair and rocked and studied how they could play that hairy man one more trick. In the meantime, Wiley ran around and did everything he could think of to keep the hairy man from coming inside the cabin. He tied up one of his hound dogs on the front porch and one out back. He closed the shutters and set up a broom handle across the window because no evil thing can step over a broom handle. He built a big fire in the fireplace in case the hairy man had a mind to come down the chimney. Finally, his mama stopped rocking and said, run out to the barn, Wiley, and bring me back one of those newborn baby pigs. As Wiley was going to the barn, a peculiar animal, sort of like a boar, only twice as big, ran by. One of Wiley's hound's dogs broke loose and chased after it. Then when Wiley was coming back from the barn with the baby pig in his arms, another animal, big as a horse with a long horn growing from its nose, ran by. Wiley's other dog broke away and tore after it, and it disappeared. Wiley slammed the door of the cabin behind him and shut the latch tight. Put the pig in your bed, Wiley, and heap up all the covers on top of it, said his mama. So Wiley did that, and as he was pulling the covers over the pig, he got a creepy feeling up around the back of his neck. There was a scraping against the wall of the cabin, then the noise of footsteps on the roof, only it didn't sound quite like a person's footsteps. Ooh, that's hot, the hairy man hollered. He started cursing and swearing something fierce, and the whole cabin shook so hard that Wiley thought it would fall down around him. Soon there was a knock on the door. Quick, scoot up into the loft where he can't see you, Wiley's mama whispered, and when he was out of sight, she opened the door. Mama, the hairy man hollered out, I done come to get your young'un. Well, you can't have him, said Wiley's mama. Then I'll bite you and poison you, he shouted. I'll bite you and poison you right back she said. Give him here or I'll set your house on fire with lightning. I got plenty of sweet milk to put out that fire, said Wiley's mama. Give him over or I'll dry up your spring, make your cow go dry, and send a million bull weevils out of the ground to eat up your cotton. Harry man, you wouldn't do all of that, would you? That's mighty mean. I'm a mighty mean man. If I give you my baby... Will you go on away from here and leave everything else alone and never come back? Wiley's mama asked. I swear that's just what I'll do if you give me your baby. She opened the door wide and let the hairy man into the cabin. He's over there in that bed, she said. The hairy man crossed over to the bed and snatched off the covers. Hey, he hollered. There ain't nothing here but a little baby pig. Did I say what kind of baby I was giving you? Asked Wiley's mama. That pig sure is a baby, and he belonged to me before I gave him to you. The hairy man yelled, gnashed his teeth, and stomped all over the cabin. He grabbed that baby pig and stormed out the door into the swamp, knocking down a tree as he ran. Wiley came down from the loft and looked out the cabin door. It seemed as if a tornado had just passed by. He called and called till his hound dogs were home safe, and he went inside and grabbed his mama. They sashayed around the cabin and whooped and hollered, We did it, Mama, said Wiley. We fooled him three times. As long as they lived, and that was a long, long time, the hairy man never did bother Wiley or his mama ever again. Ah. Uh.
So we have this enormous unconscious force that has carried off Wiley's father. And, you know, if our, if our parent has been through a trauma, that trauma will, will haunt us. It will, will, uh, kind of, you know, um, stomp around the edges of our lives. Uh, you know, and, and we'll, it'll be something that we'll have to come to terms with. And that might be that we have a, a parent, you know, God forbid, who committed suicide or experienced a tremendous failure or, or whatever it is, that this will be something that will influence us. But uh, while he is faced with it, I mean, he, he goes out into the world and there is the hairy man waiting for him. So oftentimes what got our parents, we're afraid, will be the same thing that gets us. And he has these protective instincts in the form of the dogs, but, uh, but he leaves them at home one day. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. And he has the support from his mother, or what we might call the mother part of his own psyche, the, the feminine wiliness. Uh, comes to his aid. Uh, so it, it's a wonderful uh, story with a lot of a um, lot of sass and vigor and and feeling tone about the the sins of the father, so to speak, yes. or yes. the fate of the father uh, does not have to be permanently visited upon the son. But it probably is something we're going to have to wrestle with. Yep. We will have to wrestle with it. And, and that is the human story. Uh, if it isn't, you know, it, it's going to be one thing after another, challenges, defeats, complexes, circumstances, the whole host of this thing we call life. And, and how do we bring ourselves to it? This reminds me of some research that came out years ago. I'm sure we're all aware of it. When they were doing research on why some children are resilient to trauma. And one Mm -hmm. of the findings was, if the child has at least one adult Mm -hmm. that has a kind of sincere, loving interest in the child, even if it's not somebody in the family per se, that they become substantially more resilient to the trauma that they are or have endured in childhood. So it's wonderful that the mother's, you know, abiding love Mm. for Wiley acts as a kind of protective medicine. We also see that archetype in the Harry Potter films, that the mother in her dying moment imparts an ancient magic to the infant Harry Potter so that Voldemort, who is a kind of demonic creature affects him, leaves a mark on him, but cannot kill him. Mm -hmm. So this idea of the protective love of at least one person Mm -hmm. is essential for all of us and sometimes can be enough. Mm -hmm. We don't have to have a perfect life, but someone needs to love us. You know, Wiley's story is is a lot of fun, but it, it does bring up uh, a more kind of serious uh, research of that captures the same reality of how parental complexes kind of affect the child. And that is the research, again, that I, I'm sure a lot of us are familiar with about the children of Vietnam veterans, the children of Holocaust survivors. And, and what was discovered when they looked at the kind of psychosocial functioning of these children of, you know, survivors of great trauma is that there, there was kind of an intergenerational transmission that, that is somewhat mysterious, uh, you know, that there were higher cortisol levels and, and other kinds of um, sequelae. So, you know, the, 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 what, what our parents lived through affects us even though we didn't live through it. And, and just like Wiley, we're, we're probably going to meet the same hairy man that got our dad, but hopefully we can uh, craft a kind of creative response to it. Mm-hmm. In an older version of the tale that's a little more frightening, the father in the beginning of the story is characterized as a criminal, mm-hmm. as a ne'er-do-well, as somebody who's 
kind of dangerous and that the the idea is that when he passes away the hairy man will be waiting for him which then becomes a metaphor for the devil right and just as we were saying that even though the boy hasn't passed away but that devilishness is around him we could almost imagine that maybe wiley is going through puberty so there's an awakening of his own hairiness yeah yes and and if he didn't have a model for somebody who had an instinctive energy but also could shape that in appropriate and pro-social ways, then the boy's going to have to wrestle through that um, without the benefit of ha- having been modeled. Right, right. That's, so, that's, yeah. And I think that that's exactly true, right? Like if you do have a father who is kind of, you know, living the life of a criminal, the boy does need a way to understand how to shape his instincts and his impulses in a way that's, as you said, Joseph, more pro-social. So that's a really great uh, addition. Our dreamer today is a 23-year-old female who works as a hospice administration and psychotherapy intern. And her title for her dream is The Man in the Junkyard. I had a dream the other night that I was at work. I work in hospice and was in the elevator. I was told I needed to go down to the basement for some reason, so I begrudgingly got in the elevator. The elevator went down many levels until I got to an abandoned warehouse. The warehouse had numerous cats jumping around in tires that were laid on the ground. It was a giant basement that appeared to be a junkyard. I saw a man in this junkyard. He was the only person there. And he approached me. I immediately got anxious and backed away. He spoke to me and said, I want you to come down here at least once a day. His presence frightened me less over time, and eventually I got back on the elevator feeling a sense of love for this man. Defying all logic and not remembering why I needed to go down in the first place, my dream self-planned to visit him again the next day. As for significant context, she writes, I'm going to start my clinical therapy internship soon. I've been working in hospice, which has helped me to be less fearful about death, which has always been a main focus area of worry for me. I'm also getting married in a month to my partner of six years. Her main feelings in the dream were fear at the beginning and confusion, but love and peace at the end. And as for associations, she writes, I was scared of the man, but became less fearful the longer I stayed with him. There was a sense of abandonment in the dreamlike junkyard, with garbage all over and mainly tires. The cats were living in these tires. There was still a lot of life in this junkyard, but no one ever appeared to come down here. The man was very patient and kind, but appeared scary at first. Oh, this is a great dream about overcoming a complex, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I love the, you know, right at the outset, I was told yes. I needed to go down to the basement, mm-hmm. quote, for some reason. We don't know why. So but I begrudgingly got, right, she followed. Well, wait a minute. Our waking ego would say, why do you want me to go down there? What am I supposed to do? No, she follows directions. And that, um, again, that's uh, von Franz's uh, feeling and thought that when your the dream ego is told to do something, the dream ego should probably do it. And, of course, basements, the forest, the ocean, are one of the great symbols for the unconscious. So she had to go down into the unconscious for some reason, Mm -hmm. obviously to retrieve something she had left behind uh, as a person in her own life, something that's down there. 
that needs to be encountered. Uh, uh, I just love the scene of the cats jumping around in tires mm -hmm. and, and a basement that appears to be a junkyard. And yep. that is a great symbol for shadow. Uh, this is a junk I don't like. I don't want it. I just have mm -hmm. to throw it in the junkyard. Um, and all these cats, often symbols of feminine instinct and life, are, are living down there. And then the scary man, who, when befriended, is befriending. Mm-hmm. So I just want to say I'm I'm usually the dream picker and this morning I went into our pile of dreams and this was just on the top of the pile which is what I often do I just start with the one at the top of the pile and unless there's a real reason not to take it I I usually take it but I this dream is just such a beautiful little dream well and it's actually not so little but it's it's sort of short and spare Right. Um, but just, you know, it's actually very profound, I think. And, and, and I just was marveling as I went about my morning, like, I, 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 dreams are so amazing. Like, how could you read this dream? This is just, this is just one dream. This is just the one that was on the top of the pile. And it's so eloquent and so full of wisdom. So I, I just sort of bow to the majesty of dreams, mm -hmm. uh, I think is the first thing I, I want to start with. But, you know, we if we look at the setting, she's at work. And and I I do I do wonder if the dream does uh relate to to her professional sphere. She's about to start her internship, but of course, her work has a broader uh scope to it because she works in hospice. So she actually works in the land between the living and the dead. So it could have the more narrow sense of, you know, what's going on in her professional life, but it, it could also be speaking to this kind of larger realm that her work uh, points toward. And, uh, you know, to go down, as you said, Deb, into the unconscious, to visit the realm of shadow and to find there a very, um, you know, um, unusual onimus figure. The, the onimus figure who understands the ways of the underworld. And wants her to be connected. I mean, I'm thinking she intimates to us that she had a fear of death, which is something people have. And then she's done this wonderful thing to get over it, which is to work in hospice, which is exactly the right thing to do, is to really look death in the face. And, and in some sense, being so in touch with death is really vivifying and enlivening. And I wonder if her visit to the underground junkyard is in, in part something similar to what happens at work when she can is sort of daily like once a day probably reminded of the reality of death that we all want to push away and not think about and and how kind of grounding uh and and empowering it is actually to to be in that space so to to have access to the unconscious. She has an elevator that takes her right there. She can meet with him every day. And the one thing I think I'd say to this dreamer is um, you might want to you might want to talk to this man in an act of imagination regularly. He might have something to say every day. I'm on board with all of the insights that you had uh, brought forward. One thing that I also imagine in a very concrete way is that most of the morgues in hospitals are in the basement. Mm. And so mm. the the bodies, yeah. which like worn out tires that have been put in the junk pile or put in the landfill or put in the grave, are often, but not always, but often in the basement. And so I think there is some relationship to to the dead, and particularly I'm curious about that something in the unconscious, I think, is interested in the bodies of the deceased. And we as humans have an enormous interest in the bodies of the deceased, which is why we have, since the beginning of time, had these very specific funerary rituals um, of all different kinds. And so I think there's a part of her that worry that not so much worries, but is curious about 
where does the worn out body go? And, and what attitude might she have or could she discover towards the body that her work doesn't end when the person is deceased? Now, sometimes in hospice work, that might be true depending on if you're doing case management, but often in hospice work, the counselor is also doing grief counseling for several weeks or months with the family. And so there is a whole other area of life after the, the soul departs the body that requires tending and loving tending, as, as the man is demonstrating. I also um, could imagine this man perhaps being a version of Hermes. Yeah. Hermes was yeah. the, the god that could go into the underworld, could lead the souls down into the underworld and be relatively unaffected. The difficulty in Hades is that everybody had to drink the water of the river Lethe, which made them forget everything about their previous lives, and in a way turned them into cats indirectly. Yeah. Yeah. Just kind of carefree, mm -hmm. um, instinctive um, creatures that are really not aware of the life that they had before, which is a very specific kind of mythology around that. But there's a secret archetypal life in her that she is beginning to sense that there is an ongoing life after someone has passed away. Now we could think about that mystically, but we don't even need to do that because the ongoing life of the deceased is alive in the family members and also to a degree forever alive in her. Because as a hospice worker, as you're taking care of the family and the deceased, it is an extremely intense environment. And no. my friends that have done hospice work, they will think about the people they have cared for for decades yeah. after that. Yep. That at least in the unconscious of this dreamer, there is, there is life. Even if the world has forgotten some of these people, she has not forgotten them, and there is something in her psyche that is caring for those memories and those images. Mm -hmm. That's lovely. Thanks for listening. To submit a dream, suggest an episode topic, or join our mailing list, visit our website, thisjungianlife.com. If you enjoyed this episode, give us five stars and a good review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and make sure to click the notification bell to be alerted whenever we upload new videos. And keep up with all things TJL by following us on Instagram, Facebook, X, and TikTok.